stay in, and then they're going to over, uh, overlap and come in a week later. They are not on the same um, calendar deadlines. They are really not working harmoniously with each other, a little bad blood of how they adjourned uh, when the outbreak happened in March. Um, so you can kind of see in the legislative track how many bills uh, ha are not moving at all. Uh, the Senate, and it is really, really up in the air of uh, if any of the bills that survived um, getting out of its house of origin will even uh, have a hearing in the Senate. Um, the Senate has threatened to hear no non-COVID related uh, or economic stimulus items uh, and that they will hold everything in its Senate rules. So we really won't know if there's any legislation that is going to be or, or non-COVID related legislation that's going to be moving until about mid-July. And mid-July is going to be a very, very important uh, point. So they, they passed, the legislature passed a budget, they wanted to get paid and make their constitutional deadline. Um, now this budget, the governor and the legislature agree on the revenue portion, but they're not agreeing on how it's going to be expended. The governors may revise uh, relied heavily on draining um, our three major reserve funds, um, our big um, rainy day fund in a three-year, um, over a three-year period, our safety net reserve, um, and our budget stabilization. Um, the legislature does not drain any of these funds. Um, the governor had about $14 billion in cuts in his May revise with public education getting about an $8 billion haircut, local governments, particular counties, and their safety net services taking a billion dollar cut. Um, and he wanted to have these cuts up front and I'm sure you heard that he had all these triggers that if this federal stimulus money materializes, the, that goes back in and those programs or that funding is preserved. With the legislature, hey, Lori, yeah. Lori, just so you know, I did include the governor's revise, the May revise in as an exhibit. So uh, if anybody okay. wants yeah, it, to yeah, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's not necessarily pretty. Um, so basically, the governor outlined all the cuts with the legislature and they passed in SB 74 is they didn't put any cuts in there. They basically uh, flipped the presumption of saying uh, if this, that they are confident that these federal dollars will materialize it. However, if they do not materialize by September 1st of this year, then the cuts under the trigger will go in effect. So it's basically, if we don't get it, these go in, rather we're gonna cut, cut, the governor wants to cut now and have these cuts take effect, and if we get the money, we'll backfill that. So it's kind of flipping the narrative. So they are, what I'm hearing from insiders in the governor's office and leadership is they, the big three, you know, there's no more big five anymore, uh, are in constant negotiations and are not really seeing eye to eye. Um, and that there is a very good possibility that the governor could veto this budget. Um, and what does that mean? Because we need to get funded come um, July 1st, uh, is that they would probably do something that we've never done is what the federal uh, government does is maybe a continuing resolution. And everyone's waiting for that July 15th date. And during this um, uh, period of lockdown and distress by taxpayers and small businesses, they deferred um, they deferred uh, the tax deadline as well as the sales sales receipt taxes until July 15th. So the state, honestly, they're saying they have a two-year operating 54.3 billion dollar budget, but they really don't know. They don't know if it's worse. Or, or if it's not as bad. Um, they are seeing, uh, the treasurer is seeing some uptick in retail um, as well as some uh, personal income taxes as some people are going back to work as phase two and phase three move throughout the state. So where we are at is that they are going through constant rounds of negotiation before the July 1st deadline to try to come up um, uh, with a workable budget of whether he's going to blue pencil um, it like crazy or that they're going to come into an agreement and fix everything and both the assembly and the senate are actually here and do a multitude of trailer bill uh, language. Now how this ties into the bond is as you know in the governor's uh, January proposal he unveiled uh, in support 
of the legislature of wanting to do a climate resiliency wildfire water quality bond. And it was about uh, $4.75 billion. Um, we participated in numerous coalition calls, both with Aqua and other um, affiliated small, medium-sized water agencies um, to, to look at what the, what the asks were going to be. Um, and the governor was, of course, you know, he's like, we will go, we can go higher, et cetera. Then COVID hits uh, and the budget, you know, uh, we're, we go from an eight, possible $8 billion surplus to $54 billion two-year uh, shortfall. However, and everyone, you know, there's still talk, there's still want of, of this water bond. And they did recent polling at the end of April, or I'm sorry, end of May, and there is still a lot of support, uh, you know, over 60%. Um, water quality and wildfires were, were ticking the highest among likely voters. Um, and where the, where the advocates and, and especially the consultants are saying, if we can get this passed by the legislature, um, the, the voters will pass it in November. Now, where it's at right now, uh, the, the vehicle that they're really looking at, uh, rather than SB45, and we've commented that, that's been around for about a year, is the assembly version of AB3256. And where this is at is it's being held in rules. It got pulled back to the committee. That means that leadership is now involved and, he does, and they don't want to move the bill. Now, speculation is they don't want to move the bill because they want to negotiate this in the big three. And what they're going to negotiate it at is taking the word water bond um, out of it and doing some type of infrastructure economic stimulus package that addresses wildlife, wa water quality, uh, infrastructure dams, et cetera. That, that, that there is, um, that's more palatable. And rather than put it through a bond uh, to the voters and put it out to bond because there is some concern that the, the state won't make bond capacity. Um, so where we are at, they need if they are going to go the bill route and put it on the ballot, that needs to be passed by the legislature on June 25th, which, you know, if you recall me earlier saying the assembly will be leaving tomorrow for three weeks. If they do, for the last chance, and according to Secretary of State Padilla, July 26th is the do or die deadline, and that is for the supplemental budget, and you know, to the cost of printing and whatnot to three to four million dollars. So we're operating under those two deadlines while still hearing that the big three are pushing pushing um, a wider package. Um, you know, the governor does want to do something. We're en we're entering fire season. Uh, some water funds are taking a hit. Um, so there is a desire, but again, we are in the upside down right now. Um, you know, uh, everything is changing and fluid uh, daily. So uh, we hey, are Lori, just yes. Is the big three the the governor and the speaker and the president of the Senate? The pro, yeah, the pro tem. Okay. Uh, the, the Republicans, uh, they, because they have a supermajority and can pass a budget on a two-thirds, the Republicans have been cut out of the negotiation process with the governor. Got it. So, uh, yeah, the, the both, both houses can pass a budget without a, Republic, a single Republican vote. So, um, again, uh, we, we are taking this day by day. Um, it's a... Uh, very, very fluid and things are changing daily and we've been trying to keep you up to date. I know one thing that we are going to be uh, working on and, and Dave will expound on it in, in his presentation later uh, in, in the committee meeting is um, kind of setting up meetings uh, with uh, agencies here, State Water Resources Control Board, uh, Housing Community Development, uh, to basically rectify the new provisions of SB 3330 and the Condition 2. So we'd want to meet with uh, Senator Skinner staff as well as um, the consultants from Senate Housing um, to basically, you know, having the housing advocates kind of work more co cohesively uh, with the water regulators. But um, Dave will kind of expound on that more, as I said. Are there any questions? Are there any questions to Lori right now? None from me. Lori, go ahead. Alvin. 
No, I didn't have any. No question. So, Lori, yeah, this Dan, is in the as, as far as the legis- uh, legislation goes, uh, you know, uh, many of those bills have died. We don't expect a lot of that to move this year. Uh, focus is going to be on COVID-19 legislation. Um, so, and, you know, if anything does pop, you know, we'll get it to you right away. But uh, that's pretty much where it is right now. So any other questions or comments? Lori, I just comment this is a little bit like a FEMA disaster report. I mean, it sounds horrible. Um, um, you know, I've been doing this since uh, I was 23 years old, so 23 years, and I have never, ever seen this. I mean, John will come to me and says, you know, what are you hearing? I'm all, I don't know. This is all brand new. Um, and the capital is a ghost town. Um, most of the cheap, most, they can only allow one staffer in at a time, and most of them, everyone's working from home, um, even, the, even the consultants and chiefs of staff. Um, it's just, uh, it's a ghost town down here, and it's, no one's really playing nice in the, in, in the sandbox, and, and we've got a $143 billion general fund budget that could possibly be vetoed for the first time. Am I not correct? Yesterday was the first time your office was actually all together in one place? Yes, <laughs> and, and, and we left and celebrated early. <laughs> uh, I, I was, but uh, oh, as you see... The, the the governor is planning to announce, and what we're, I heard as this morning from a friend of the governor's office, that he may be issuing a statewide requirement to wear a facial mask. I heard so they did F- that today. Yeah. They did that today. He already did it? I, I already, I already I heard today. it this morning, yeah. And I'm that there's possible go. counties that will be rolling back. That they're seeing, like Sacramento County, for example, in the last 14 days, has had a 30%, 38% increase in its positive uh, positive cases. And it's just more yesterday, we had over more tests. More results. Doing. They're they're speculating that this has to do more with the reopenings and that people are just kind of moving about more. Um, he did do um, a report. Uh, earlier this week, which is the 14 days after Memorial Day weekend, the 14 days after the protest, and they really didn't see um, the uptick. The positivity rate was hovered around 4.1, 4.5. And as you know, with the counties um, that they have to self-attest is that they ca- it cannot go higher than 8%. And now we're starting to see a swift uptake. You know, again, just the positive cases alone, we're at, we were averaging about uh, – 12 to 1500 a day. Yesterday we we upticked over 4000. Jesus. Wow. So, uh they are talking about some counties pulling back. Um I do not know what that means for Monterey County. Um you know, you have a, a very um strict public health director. Um but uh it's as the governor is trying to, in a way, wash his hand not wash his hands, he wants to work with the locals, and especially if they have hot spots, skilled nursing facilities, uh, um, just outbreaks. But, you know, he has been faced criticism, are you opening up the state too soon? Um, you know, especially when, you know, for the first two months, public health stay in, stay in, and then all of a sudden he's like, everyone's in phase two, roll with it, here are the guidances, and counties, it's up to you. So where he has basically changed his narrative is that, you know, the state's not going to put any restrictions. If the county can self-attest to these regional variances, then they can move through. So he's putting the onus on the counties and kind of washing the state's hands of it, that they are just providing the engine that it's the, and the county is driving the car. Is that uh, COVID-19 humor, washing their hands of it? <laughs> So, um, Lori, yeah, I got a question for you on the bill tracking. So the, the gray highlighted areas that failed the deadline. Yep. Those are, those are not moving. So, but are they dead? Uh, yes, we are, we are at the end of a 2 year session. Those are dead. Okay. So the only way they could come back would be like a gut and amend or something like that. And that's highly unlikely. Oh, yeah, I very, 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 very unlikely. And I, I just my, what I'm hearing and my just experience, I would say that 85% of those that are not highlighted that are still technically alive will be dead in the next month. 
I do not think the Senate uh, is going to hear these bills, and then the Assembly, of course, will retaliate. Right, right. So uh, just the major major legislation that everyone's focusing on, and I'm sure, you know, you guys are aware, is the housing and especially the, the, the rent landlord tenant relief. Um, there is uh, a, a, a lot of contention on both sides, um, you know, as we can understand both sides of the legislature trying to, to step in um, to provide relief, that they, are, that they are fearful that, you know, once these court orders, the court orders, the executive orders, everything expires, um, that we are, that this is, an, you know, the federal uh, supplemental employment insurance, that will end at the end of the July, that things are going to get really funky uh, economically and hit the fan. So they're trying. So, yeah. Go ahead. Yes? No, I, go ahead. When you're done, I, I have another question. Yeah. So, so uh, the legislature is really right now is focusing on, you know, the housing is still huge. Uh, we're still having a, a tremendous amount of issues, uh, and we also have a lot, you know, as you know, we can go back to what we're, you're going to talk about later, Dave, is that they've been passing, you know, substantial housing legislation, especially, you know, in regulating how locals and their ordinances and development and NIMBYs and whatnot, and so this is all being implemented, and you have locals that have all these requirements. And now we are now we are in a, in a pandemic world. Everything's upside down, and so there's more questions than we have answers. Yeah. So um, I, I to see if they are going to try to alleviate or fix things before they hit uh, lawsuit status. We don't know. And then of course you know the big one is the all the all mail voting. Uh, all, all the all mail ballot. Uh, there is legislation, even though the governor did an executive order. They want legislation. It makes it look more unified, <laughs> and statute will hold up stronger uh, than an executive order. And of course, you know they're going to get. There's already a lawsuit locally, and there's going to be a federal challenge. So uh, the legislature needs to move on that as well. So what I wanted to ask the committee members, um, if you have the bill tracking. Uh, exhibit in front of you. There are a few I want to ask particular questions about. Um, so the first one that's still alive is AB 1258. Um, say say that number again. Uh, I'm sorry, 1958. 19, okay, I was like, oh, God. Uh, yeah, yeah this, this is the Cooper bill. He tried to do it last year in 135. Um, so this is basically in response, um, as you know, you, you guys have a lot of tributaries and levies and et cetera, is that you have homeless people, particularly in Sacramento, um, that are cutting in to the levies, defacing yeah. them, you know, compromising their structural integrity to have a flat place to put up tents and, and encampments. And so this, uh, it, it, the, the laws, sketchy on this current law and so this gives um, locals um, a little more control and a little more enforcement of you know uh, some however what abatement tactics you would want to work with your local homeless population yeah and I guess my question to the the group is this one and the next one while they're water related I don't think we have a dog in the hunt and so do we want to just continue to Gloss over them. Um, that would be my so, recommendation. I mean, the que my question would. So you don't have any levy. So you're not. Wouldn't be impacted by either 1958 or uh, 2060, correct? Yeah, not really. We've got a huge homeless encampment behind the Safeway on the river, and so occasionally when our crews are in doing things. Uh, there's uh, communication, and, and they do, do, do they do some digging. There is a levy. Um, you know, right behind the, the Rio shopping center, but I don't perceive it as being a, a big issue for us regionally or locally. Yeah, and, and Dave, I also put it on there because, you know, uh, we are uh, very good partners with Aqua. 
And yeah, and you know, that was the you, only reason I brought it up is did we? Yeah, we throw? and we regularly, and especially you know, you get contacted directly to come and support, and you know, and I think we discussed this last committee meeting is like it, it may be an indirect impact, but of being you know in the spirit of being good partners uh, that we've signed on to certain things. So I had it on there for that, and I think that was one of the bills I did want to talk to you about. Well, and that's my ask to the committee. Do you want to? Move it to support just out of a courtesy to Aqua or skip it. Well, I, I do think it's so important to back up members, Aqua. What do you think? I mean, if, so you're asking Dave, do we want to show some, you know, unity amongst the water purveyors or water agencies with Aqua? I don't see a problem with that. Okay. So let's, uh, Lori, go ahead and label that one that will support and um, be available. I'll get for a you know, I'll letter have, of support or whatever. I'll have a letter to you by next week, Dave. Okay. Then I wanted to go down to um, the AB 2333. And previously we said uh, no support or oppose. Yeah, that's, that's on the last floor analysis. Um, it, it just kind of gives you, um, or at least it's for me, it does. Uh, of where, where this Wait, 23, the court, correct? Yeah, court. Yep. So right now, as of the last analysis, there is no official support, there is no official opposition. Um, so it's, a lot of these are for notes of, you can see like yeah. the in pros versus labor, kind of where the fight is. Um, there, there's really none right here. So, okay. Um, so let's just leave this one off. I wasn't sure if that was our previous no support or opposition. So I don't think we need to do no, anything there. I just, I just put notes where, where the bills that were moved that, that they're, um, you know, as I say, it's position and notes. Uh, yep. we did not take position at, uh, last, uh, legislative committee. Right. So let's drop down to AB 2560, another court bill where aqua is the co-sponsor yes do we want to kind of put that in the same category as a courtesy to aqua that we if asked would support i would that's think something. i that's why i revisit it yeah go ahead one at a time dave i was going to say i was going to ask the committee if they're comfortable with you know allegiance with with aqua alvin you good with that yeah, I'm good with Stan with Aqua. We support them, they support us. Okay. I will have a letter for you. Okay, and then yeah. th then uh, two of them I wanna talk about together is AB 2954 and AB 30 or 3005. Yeah, these are the Rebus bills. Okay, the first one we may have an interest in just in general. Uh, the second one we have no actual interest in but we've gotten pretty close to Robert Rivas um, through Pure Water Monterey. And uh -huh. when the uh, FISCAL program was delaying all of our construction payments, uh, Rivas's staffer, I don't think it was his chief of staff, but one of his key staffers intervened and actually broke the dam for us. So we have kind of a warm place in our heart for Robert Rivas and and he's also a, a young comer. He'll he'll do really well in Sacramento, I suspect. He's um, doing very well. Got it. So again, as a, knowing him as well as I do, knowing, knowing Robert as well as I do, I think he's a very very good guy. So whatever he needs for support, if he's been good to us, we should be good to him. Okay. So these two bills, if asked, or uh, we can volunteer to support. Great. Okay, and actually a follow-up question I have for you, Dave, is when we talked about the Anderson Dam one, that's 3005, you said that you had had a conversation with their agency GM, I think? Yeah, it, it, uh, Director of Operations, yeah, a guy named, uh, oh, name escapes me. I actually had lunch with him and, yeah, talked about it. So, um, yeah, and again, I, I, I think this one's likely to move. So. We would do this basically as a goodwill gesture to Revis, and we don't have any policy issues with it. Right, and and I think you know, um, 
in support of water supply in general as a you know pr an, a prime need in the state, um, even if it's not us locally. Yeah, just some form of water industry support for this. Okay. And Great. Um, I will have those four letters to you uh, next week. Yeah. Okay. And then and then I'll forward that letter to the Santa Clara Valley uh, contact I have, just as a you know as a courtesy. Um, actually, you know it. Uh, or no, whatever you want. Let, let me talk to Revis' staff because a lot of them are inside. I want to see if they know if this thing's moving. A lot of these offices are getting told to hang their bills back, even if, even if they're moving forward. So yeah, okay, uh, that's fine. Rather than you do work and I do work, let me make sure that these um, are going to be uh, flying flying through. As I said, I think 3005 will be going because again, uh, they have that uh, October deadline. Okay, and then I want to drop all the way down to SB 1099. 1099. Yep. yep. Um, I see that it's aqua supported. We've been uh, involved in the current rate case for CalAM and the issue of backup generators is paramount. They've actually been a little remiss. They've been trying to get a, uh, they don't have a single backup generator that install as best we can tell um and it's becoming more important with the psps's the public safety power shutoffs um but we have extended periods of time here too where you know pg e will you know branch falls and they're down for a couple of days um i think we have an interest in this honestly so again i put this on our support list um, Any objections to that? Bill? Committee members, any objection to having it on the support list? No, go ahead, put it on there. I think we could support okay, that. Okay. Got it. So, beautiful. Okay. Um, then there's one that I wanted the group to look at. It's uh, SB 1293. Twelve ninety three, which is uh, Allen. Yeah. Yeah, that bill is gonna. If that bill does not pop out, pop off rules by uh, next week, it's not gonna be moved. Okay, so let's just sit and wait. But you know, if it's if it survives, I'd like us to look at it again to see if this is a big uh, money sink or if there's actually something of value here, because we okay. are we're coastal. Um, you know, sea level rise will affect some things. If the desal plant moves forward, they've got vul vulnerability for sea level rise, et cetera. So just want to keep an eye on that one. So I guess that's a watch. Okay, well, so I, if I would be concerned it would, about the week after, if this, for some reason this this moves and miracles happen, then I will send it to you, Dave, all the information uh, and a little more uh, detailed analysis. Yep. Um, and I'll get the fact sheet from Senator Allen's staff and have you guys discuss and let me know how would you want to proceed in any advocacy. Well, Great. I have concerns about 1293. Yeah. So unless I hear any objections, we're taking a watch position on 1293. Yeah, Jeannie uh, was about to say something. Jeannie got comments. Jeannie. I, I have Jeannie. concerns about 1293 um, in terms of... Uh, Jeannie, go ahead. What jurisdiction local entities have in in taking over property? So, I'm, I think that is not a certainly not a support at this point. Gotcha. I mean, it's it does say purchase, but I guess it begs a question: Is the door open for seizure with compensation? Right. You know, I, I would like to see more on it, Lori, and. Maybe there's something that, um, like the uh, Big Sur Land Trust, Carmel River Free Project, if there's a way to channel some money in there. The problem is it's a loan and they need more grants than anything. But it just, it, it looked like it might have uh, ramifications on the lagoon area. Yeah. One of my concerns is. In, in fact, there, there's. Grove, hey, hang on, Lori. 
uh, oh, this bill is not has not even been referred to a committee, so it has okay. no analysis. So there's no registered support or opposition. So um, I'll flag I'll flag this high priority. So if anything on it moves or anything uh, uh, formal, formally of an analysis or letters coming in, I'll be notified and kind of get a better idea of what's going on with this. Okay, Janie, you had some more. Right, we've just got our. Um, coastal trail plan from the consultants who have stated that Ocean View Boulevard is detrimental to the access to the um, the coast trail, which uh, main thoroughfare and the main access to the coast. And I know coastal staff at Santa Cruz have promoted. Um, Deeming the houses along Ocean View as vulnerable. So I. Yeah, yeah. Could be too far. Yeah, really. Well, we couldn't afford to buy up all those houses on Ocean View Boulevard anyway. <laughs> and I'm not just not, not the district. I mean, just any entity. But Pacific Grove buy them up. They're flush with cash. <laughs> That's all I had on the bill tracking on the state level. Thanks. All right, John, Lori, thank you. Is there anything else for the good of the order from this department? Not at this time. We're good. All right. Well, we'll stay in tune as the masters of disaster, I guess. <laughs> um, so why don't we move on to the Ferguson group to their report on federal legislative status and bill tracking. And How's just it going back in D.C. just as well? And just so you know, their materials uh, were not in the packet, but they were posted on the and, and forwarded to you and posted on the website as additional materials. Got it. All right, guys, thank the floor you. is yours. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Roger Gwynn, and um, the, just a, I'm going to give you a, just a general overview and then uh, turn it over to well, my colleagues to fill in uh, a little bit more, give you a little bit more detail on. Uh, the status of some hearings will be important to, of interest to you and uh, and uh, talk about uh, infrastructure package and things of that sort in the, our bill tracker. Uh, just general update, uh, the Senate was in session this week while the House of Representatives continued to do most of its work remotely. Uh, they, the House of Representatives like you, are uh, doing all of their hearings on a remote basis. Uh, most, most notable today, uh, uh, this is the second day of hearings on the Invest Act, which uh, uh, Stephanie will talk a little bit more about later, but uh, which is the large uh, half a trillion dollar transportation initiative, uh, and that's uh, they're continuing to work through amendments on that bill. Um, the House is scheduled to come back uh, the beginning of uh, the week of actually uh, June 25th is when they will return to the uh, Capitol. And um, th that's to, they'll be considering uh, their version of the uh, law enforcement reform bill. The, the Senate is going to start work on its law enforcement reform bill next week. And um, and then beyond that, uh, there's a lot of attention on just COVID-19 related activities. There's just a whole host of, of activity uh, uh, going on uh, with uh, several different emphasis. One is uh, certainly to uh, create opportunities for expanded uh, assistance relief funding for local governments. Uh, there is one bill which uh, the, the uh, district sent a letter on behalf of what was introduced by Mr. Garamendi, which would expand eligible entities for future cro uh, coronavirus re related relief funds, expand that to include special districts like yourselves and uh, there that's been uh, being advocated by Mr. Garamendi and uh, your two senators are looking at, at looking at that legislation as well and working to try to uh, create uh, and encourage administrative flexibility to allow special districts to, to receive funding in the future. Um, and again, well, that's uh, uh, again, uh, uh, certainly uh, um, uh, Representative Garamendi was certainly uh, happy and you know appreciated the support there. Uh, on the uh, but another uh, 
just an example of the kind of things that uh, the types of issues the members are focused on. Uh, your representative, Representative Panetta, uh, has been led a letter that was signed by 18 members of the California delegation uh, in support of to the House leadership, asking that uh, any future coronavirus related re uh, re relief effort also include robust funding for um, uh, the uh, fire uh, forest fire uh, wildland fire management preparedness uh, programs uh, within the National Forest Service lands. So there's just a great deal going on there on the COVID-19 related front and um, uh, We'll continue. We expect that we are expecting an additional package to come together by the end of the, um, you know, of the uh, of July in all likelihood. Um, the uh, but there's still significant differences between where the House and Senate are on a package and the scope and size of that package. Uh, just one other thing uh, before I turn it over to, to uh, Chris, the, uh, you know, the House on the appropriation side. Uh, that too is uh, getting started. Uh, the, we expect the House Appropriations Committee to start marking up the appropriations bills in at the first week of, Ju of July, week of Ju July 6th, and they are planning, the House is planning to bring all of all 12 appropriations bills to the floor of the House by the end of July, so before the August break. A couple of things to note there, there uh, that are under that uh, will hopefully be addressed in future in the appropriations process. Uh, one is additional funding for the Pure Water Monterey project. We're expecting that to be included in that package. We're still waiting on a letter uh, uh, request from the Secretary of the Interior to come forward so that that could be included in the package, but that's expected to be coming forward here before the FY21 appropriations process concludes. We're also um, on the Senate side, they are going to be, um, they had planned to start uh, marking up their bills next week on Monday. Uh, and actually the energy and water bill was supposed to be on, uh, be on full, in full committee on Thursday of next week. Uh, a week from today, but uh, that's being kind of caught at this point and some uh, back and forth between the majority of the minority on uh, on addressing COVID-19 related issues in the appropriations process, as well as police reform matters in that same process. So the, uh, they thought they had a bipartisan agreement on how to proceed, but that apparently is uh, a little bit on hold at this point, but maybe worked out by next week and hopefully it will. Uh, the um, beyond the uh, uh, again, the uh, direct money for pure water Monterey, there is, uh, uh, the, the Senate is expected to consider uh, add or to add resources to start the uh, core WIFIA program, uh, a water infrastructure financing initiative through the Corps of Engineers, and that would create another source of funding for low cost long term financing that the district uh, and its partners could go after for uh, significant water, you know, major water infrastructure improvements going forward. And that's a great program, as you probably are already aware. It's uh, that offers uh, 35 year financing at very, very low cost and, uh, and is a, is a, you know, offers great savings to non federal sponsors for water projects. Uh, with that, let me turn it to Chris to talk to you a little bit about the uh, water hearings uh, that are coming up and the, a little bit more on the word of bill, Water Resource Development Act. Thanks, Roger, and good afternoon, everyone. A um, couple of things first on the word of the Water Resource Development Act. The um, House and Senate committees have been busy. The Senate um, some time back this uh, moved their bill out of committee that focused not only on authorization of uh, Army Corps of Engineers projects, as this, this bill does approximately every two years, but also has moving in parallel with it, um, Safe Drinking Water uh, SRF um, provision, as well as some Safe Drinking Water, broader Safe Drinking Water provisions. That bill moved out of the Senate committee um, overwhelmingly bipartisan support as it always does. It's waiting, uh, awaiting floor time in the Senate. Uh, the exact timing of that's unclear at this point. Uh, it is probable that um, it will be late in the session, maybe even after the election before that bill uh, clears the Senate and perhaps um, conferences with the House. We're hopeful it'll be sooner than that, um, but there's just so much uncertainty as you can imagine these days with 
COVID and police reform and uh, the tight calendar and the number of days that people are physically um, in town. Um, on a related matter in the Senate, before we get to the House, which is a little bit more specific and clear, a little more clear cut. Um, also in the Senate, as we, we think we talked about in our last um, call, and has been ongoing the last couple of sessions, the Senate Energy Committee has continued to uh, develop and advance a series of Western water uh, related provisions that affect primarily the Bureau of Reclamation. Two of note um, that are progressing, have progressed out of committee in some form or another and have uh, somewhat broad based bipartisan support are a provision that would uh, provide for mandatory or guaranteed funding to deal with extraordinary maintenance backlog of reclamation facilities from canals to dams to um, various and other related pieces of the infrastructure. And then also a bill by Senator Feinstein, which has moved in fits and starts over the last couple of Congresses that would establish a broad-based effort for the Secretary of Interior to um, move forward on the construction of surface and groundwater storage projects. Um, if there is a uh, word of bill in the Senate, uh, the Energy Committee hopes to be able to attach a so-called reclamation title that would include those two bills and two or three others um, that have bipartisan support that would be included in the title of the bill. Um, so that would be an area where perhaps if there was something to expand on Title 16 or some of the other provisions that you have interest in, uh, they would create an, a legislative uh, vehicle opportunity, if not in the Senate, perhaps when it comes to the House to be included. So we're following the developments there. Um, but as I said, they remain somewhat fluid because of the uncertainty of floor time and all the other things going on. In the House, the focus on the Army Corps of Engineers, the word of bill there is a bit more narrow. The package that the uh, Transportation Infrastructure Committee is developing is more focused exclusively, strictly on um, the typical word of bill that just reauthorize or is authorizes uh, core projects. Um, that is, you know, somewhat typical of what they've done in the last couple of Congresses, where they have taken a very narrow approach um, in terms of their jurisdiction, the scope of their bill, knowing that they'll fight with the Senate along the lines of what I just described. This year may be slightly different because the um, House Natural Resources Committee, which has jurisdiction over the Bureau of Reclamation, has, um, in anticipation of something like this happening, has developed their own package of bills that are a bit more conservation focused, a bit more water recycling um, and water management, water conservation provisions, which would set up a very interesting uh, dynamic depending on how all the pieces come together. We expect that bill to be released um, out of the House TNI committee soon. Uh, with a hearing fairly quickly to follow, and the expectation is that the committee is likely to uh, mark up or report their word of bill out of committee just after the 4th of July recess. I think the target date now is the 6th of July. Um, they are hopeful to bring it to the floor uh, in the days and weeks after that. We think, frankly, no, having um, had the opportunity to have some intelligence from the Democratic House leadership here in the last 24 to 48 hours, it would appear that the calendar for floor time does not provide for the word of bill to come to the floor before the August recess. So we would expect that to come to the floor at some point in September. Um, I would stress, though, uh, that an Army Corps of Engineers project, a word of bill, has historically been very bipartisan. There are, pro there are core projects in just about all 50 states. Uh, a bill oftentimes goes through twists and turns as the different chambers try to attach different things to one of the few bipartisan bills that fall into the cause I must pass category, particularly in a uh, contentious election year like this one. So we would expect ultimately there to be a bill, um, and we would expect there to be, frankly, likely some provisions related to the Bureau of Reclamation. How many is unclear at this point. And in all practicality, though, as has been the case in the last, uh, certainly the last word of bill, and I believe the one before, we're probably looking at something after the election, and frankly, even just depending on the dynamics, perhaps into the first quarter of next year. But uh, we do expect a bill. We do expect something to happen. Uh, the timing, just because of the uncertainty as we have have seen with all kinds of things these days, uh, remains uncertain. So that's kind of the highlights I have on those two. Great, great. Thank, uh, and one other, just real quick, uh, Dave, if we could, uh, Stephanie will just cover real quickly the uh, infrastructure related issues, the outlook there again, related specifically to water infrastructure. And uh, just talk briefly, uh, uh, Stephanie, if you would, about the uh, stormwater provisions and the water bills. I think the district would be interested in that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. So the, the Senate order bill, uh, which we've seen, as Chris mentioned, 
has a, a couple different stormwater related provisions in there. Um, the primary provision that would be of interest is um, authorizing $250 million for a, uh, it's a sewer overflow and stormwater reuse grant program. So it's really the first grant program um, in decades really that has provided money for those types of projects. So the stormwater reuse component um, would definitely be of interest to you. And it's something that, um, you know, we've been working on for a few years now and um, we'll continue to be pushing for the appropriators to actually provide the money that's, that's um, hopefully going to be authorized. But there's uh, broad support for that. So we're um, encouraged by that as well. Um, the, the bill also uh, proposes to increase uh, funding for the Clean Water SRS, uh, which is really positive and codifies a 10% set aside of grants and loan guarantees which is another very positive thing. And as you know, the Clean Water SRS in California, uh, funding is very restricted. There's a, a lot of demand and not enough money um, to, to, to meet the demand of, of projects. So a greater infl influx of funds would be really positive. And also um, from the stormwater perspective, uh, there is a new, uh, office at EPA called the Municipal Ombudsman's Office. And uh, that office was specifically set up uh, so uh, local governments and entities of local governments, et cetera, can uh, have someone at EPA to reach out to, to ask questions about um, funding programs, about guidance that is of interest to them, um, about stormwater programs. Um, so it's really a great contact and they've been really responsive. Uh, they just got set up in the last few months. And I bring that up in WERDA because the WERDA bill would expand uh, the authority of the office. And um, one of the more positive expansions of authority would be assisting uh, with, with grants specifically, um, which is where uh, most people need some assistance and some guidance to determine uh, which programs would be best, and it you know provides a conduit that hasn't been there before. Um, so those are all uh, positive um, provisions that are in the water bill. Uh, moving to talking about infrastructure more generally, um, as Roger mentioned earlier, uh, there's this Invest Act moving uh, through the House. Uh, it's a transportation-focused bill. Uh, but we bring it up because it's been uh, discussed as a potential vehicle for a larger infrastructure package, if that were to ever come about. Um, I, everything's still quite unclear about that. Um, but today, uh, the House has, uh, they haven't actually introduced legislative language yet, so we can't provide you much detail on this, uh, but they have provided a fact sheet on a bill they're calling the Moving Forward Act, and it is an infrastructure package. Um, it's a $1.5 trillion package uh, that covers um, all, a, a wide uh, array of infrastructure, roads, bridges, broadband, water, uh, hospitals, schools. Um, so it's, it's a very comprehensive package. and. Um, from the water side, uh, there would be about $65 billion in uh, wastewater and drinking water that would include stormwater. Uh, again, we're, we don't have many details about that, but um, we suspect that's through the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, um, probably the stormwater grant program that we were just talking about. Um, and it, again, doesn't provide specifics on this, but uh, there is a bullet point in the fact sheet that talks about um, uh, investing in water infrastructure for drought preparedness and improving water supply reliability. Uh, so that's positive. Also, Stephanie, um, is there a bill number yeah. on that? It's HR2. Yes, but um, we don't have the text yet. So, yeah. Yeah. And HR. Uh, Roger, did you? What was it say? HR2. Yeah. Is the invest in, a, in America Act right, and so this is this would be added into that. Is that the case, or is it um, being dropped in? 
In any case, um, yeah, I'm not sure how the yeah, that's just what the, yeah. the fact sheet has it. I'm not sure how yeah. they're going to combine think, it. Okay. Um, but so the bill probably, also yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, would reinstate Build America bonds and advance refunding bonds and increase and expand uh, private activity bonds as well. And that's so those not... are just some of the highlights. But once we get uh, you know more more details, we'll send uh, send that to you. Sorry, Roger, go ahead. As I, and, I, and I get HR two is actually you know was is the uh, invest in America Act and so that's the the right now just the transportation bill uh, it's going to be expanded to include all of these provisions uh, we we will it is not in the tracker now but it will be you know in uh, in the next tracker we will certainly yeah. add that in. Um, speaking of the tracker, I got four questions similar to what we asked about with Sacramento. Um, so this is uh, Chair Potter. This is through the committee. Just wanted to. Uh, check your pulse. I don't know if you have the tracker available to you. Yes. Um, as I said, it was sent separately, but um, looking at HR 1162, this is a Napolitano's uh, water recycling mm -hmm. bill. Um, I think this is squarely uh, consistent with Pure Water Monterey and things that we've been doing. It's a Western States bill, uh, it's a Title 16 bill. I think um, I, you know, I'd like to be in a position to support it. Um, it's a little FN outlook, you know, it has a likelihood of getting out of committee and to the whole floor. And so it, I think that's a bill that we should put on our support list and if needed, uh, or when it's appropriate do a support letter. The you next one. That direction. Go ahead. You need direction for that? Yeah. I was just asking, is there any concern? I'd support it. No, for me, I support it. I support it. Great. Uh, the next one is 2313. Um, da, 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 da. This is the one that we've already done a letter of support previously. Um, while it has a, a, a dim statistic of getting to the full floor, um, if it gets to the floor, it looks likely to pass. This is the one where um, there's income taxes on our water rebates currently, and there's no income taxes on electrical rebates. So this is trying to right. level, level the playing field. So I'd like to have continued support for us to, uh, if needed, you know, continue to write letters of support or do whatever we can to move I that I would certainly one. support that. I'm good with it. Okay. I agree. And then the next one is 2665. Um, I don't think that we're really uh, likely to avail ourselves of this, but I know that the Water Reuse uh, Association is supporting it. So again, this would be another one of those as a courtesy to one of our parent organizations that if asked, um, I'd like to be able to support. Fine with me. You guys? That's fine. All right. And then the next one, I think it's a Senate bill. No, it's a, it's a House bill. It's this um, uh, HR 4891. And this is just adding more money to the Bureau of Reclamation's Water Smart program. Uh, we have received money when I say we, this was uh, uh, joint with uh, Monterey One Water for Pure Water Monterey. But we also got a Water Smart grant for the uh, drought contingency plan. So from time to time, there's, um, there's things that apply directly to the district. So more money is, is a good idea. Who knows if it'll get anywhere, but um, again, I'd like, uh, authorization to support it oh good with me that's fine Any? Okay. yeah sounds good okay that's great the only other one on this list was 7073 the garamendi bill that um, i think uh we already did a letter of support which we'll talk about in just a second and uh, the others you know we'll continue to watch and as roger said they'll add the uh other bills to the watch list. Some of these that I didn't mention, Roger, can probably fall away, but I'll, I'll look at it again. 
and uh, we can kind of limit what's on this list. Perfect. Thank you. All right. That's all I have. Roger, I had a question for you. It's not really water related, but how much focus is going on or even concern about the ever increasing national debt that this country is taking on these days? Uh, not a lot. Does anybody I'd think say. it's a damn? No that's, one, that's, no one that's is amazing. really, uh, yeah, it is amazing. It's uh, quite a difference from, you know, five years ago, 20 years ago, whatever, you know, from, uh, it's, it's just, uh, it's the, the attitude uh, now is, which you don't have the fortune of doing in, at the state level, is all we, need, the, the, all we need to do is that's what I was gonna say, all we need to do is print money and uh it's not, not yeah. nothing to worry about right now we could print it if there, there is no limit um and you know the the sort of the reality of the situation is though i mean in terms of uh the the the, the sense is that what their members are hearing from on a fairly broad basis right now is that um, not a lot of concern from the economists. Uh, obviously, you hear the Federal Reserve chairman saying that uh, more fiscal stimulus is needed uh, now, and because they are seeing this as a uh, a longer term recovery effort, and the cost of money is so inexpensive, uh, and that's um, and so the part of the thought is that if uh, you know if we can borrow money now for you know a percent, a percent and a half. Uh, this is the time we ought to be investing more. Uh, this is the argument for the infrastructure portion of it. You know, we ought to be investing more in things that will generate in, in the in the nation in the infrastructure of the nation that will generate uh, value and benefits for the long term. So, you know, but right now there's not a lot of concern about the you know the impact of the deficit. That's for certain. Well, when I was in D.C. with Jeannie and Ray, Ray had a some really interesting reality checks on what a billion dollars means, what a trillion dollars really looks like when you take it in consideration of what it really is a trillion, what is really a billion numerically. Amazing. Well, it is. Here's what it is. Right. All right. Are there any questions for Ferguson Group, guys? Uh, no questions. David, 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 no. Me? No. David, uh, David, I just want to thank you for being vigilant on both the state and the federal track on the bills. I think those are good suggestions. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. We'll deem that report received without exception, both that and the, and the uh, JEA one. Let's move on to the general manager's report on recent and upcoming legislative actions. Did that cover just now or do you have more, Dave? Uh, well, I think you've actually seen it. Um, both these letters were on uh, any yep. COVID relief um, needs to include special districts. So we sent these out actually with your approvals on what we just talked about. By the time we reach our next meeting, there may be some more letters, but we haven't done a whole lot. Well, there hasn't been a whole lot to support or oppose anyway. Um, I did want to highlight that I, I think I sent around to you all uh, Stephanie's uh, note that Panetta's office was very pleased that we uh, issued a letter of support on uh, HR 7073 because he was a co-sponsor. Um, and so I was pleased to, to hear that. I, I wasn't aware that he was a co-sponsor. So any uh, local stroke of, of, of good is, is a good thing to have. But no, that's it. It's just been those two letters. Uh, and then in a later discussion item about housing, I'll, I'll bring you up to speed on what we're trying to do locally and uh, in Sacramento. Good. All right. Any questions on that item? Nope. Not seeing any. Nope. Not hearing any. Let's move on then to item number five, Dave. Yeah. So, Water Demand Committee has heard this uh, issue uh, with some great detail. Uh, there's a big disconnect. Uh, SB uh, 30 or 330. Uh, was the uh, California Housing Crisis Act of 19, uh, I'm sorry, of 2019 that the governor signed into law in October. And it, among other things, says no local government can declare a moratorium on housing, uh, that you can't prevent affordable housing from being permitted unless there are strong findings and evidence supporting the reasons. And um, one of the reasons they have in there, written in there, is uh, a lack of water or wastewater infrastructure. And so there's current debate among 
two planning departments and you've seen the city of Monterey, they came before you as a complete board about the garden road projects. Um, the city of Seaside has some issues as well, not the least of which is a uh, large project called the ascent uh, development, which they're trying to entitle and it has need for water and um, some of the local planners are saying that the CDO is tantamount to a local moratorium. And I said, well, I don't think so. I think that the uh, Senate bill basically said, if you don't have the water infrastructure and it's been a lot of back and forth, well, is lack of water due to regulatory constraint, the same as a lack of water infrastructure. And so city of Monterey has, all, and, and the city of Seaside has already been in contact with the state housing and community development folks about our local condition two and cease and desist order. And it seems that the water board has gotten deeper into their own silo to say, we're not here to solve that problem. We're here to regulate water. And they've had some actual sidebar conversations. Uh, Steve Westoff, who's a, a junior attorney, but a very bright and studious guy, uh, had a separate phone call with the city attorney of Monterey to say, hey, you guys are opening a can of worms here over this housing issue, um, which is not productive. But um, if you have the, the chart, this was the last chart in a presentation to the Water Demand Committee. And this is the timeline. And this is, we're gonna do, make best efforts to follow through on this. And we're asking uh, John and Lori at JEA to uh, gear up to work with us. And so right now, at, at the district, we are trying to uh, kind of winnow down the ask. We went to every member of the TAC and asked for their near-term housing needs, tried to convert that to water. Monterey did a very good job. Some of the other cities did ho-hum jobs and some didn't do a very good job at all. Um, we realized we didn't reach out to the school district who's trying to do teacher housing. And uh, I think we probably wanna hear from the Navy and the Presidio uh, about their housing needs. So all in, um, we're trying to you know, craft the ask by the end of this month, that'll go back to water demand committee. The TAC members aren't gonna like it because we'll be asking them to take a haircut or we'll be saying, well, since we didn't really hear from you, we're not assigning anything or, or what have you. Um, then we'll try to finalize that in August and then begin I've already been in touch with somebody at uh, Housing and uh, Community Development, and my ending comment last week was, you know, we've got to get this, get the two agencies talking at the highest levels. Not, it's not going to work down here at our staff level, and he agreed. And so, with a phone call yesterday with the City of Monterey, they've also been contacted with the uh, Housing and Community Development. So right now, we're just trying to align who we've talked to. Are they in the same place? Um, but by August, um, I think we're going to take our issue to them. Uh, Lori mentioned going to the, the committee that uh, sponsored, you know, that put basically put SB 330 to the floor and out there. And to uh, Nancy Skinner, who's the primary author of that bill, and see if they're willing to uh, work at kind of the high policy level with the state water board and then see if we can use either health and safety as an issue to get some relief or something. And, and the, the problem, of course, is the state water board doesn't want to look like a paper tiger. They want to be a, a regulator. And so on the one hand, on the other hand, we permitted so many of these kind of projects with CalAM never putting anything into it and with the state never hearing about it and just using our rules the way we've always used our rules for the last 30 years. But now they're watching, they're, they're attending our uh, meetings, they're, they're there in the participants list and committee meetings and so forth. So we're working for hopefully a negotiated uh, solution and that'd be the September, October timeframe. And then, um, you know, we'll see what happens and see if there's an outcome and if there is, great. And if there isn't, then start over, I suppose. But, um, you know, in this, in this day where you can't, you know, drive up to Sacramento and do seven visits in a day and, and pitch your case, 
we're going to have to use the, the talents of uh, John and Lori to set up uh, multiple serial uh, phone or video conferences. But I just wanted you to, to see that's the plan. That seems to be the big uh, state level focus for us for the rest of the year. Um, then we'll just see where it goes. Comments, guys? Uh, Dave, so that John and Lori? Yeah, that's a JEA. That's our Sacramento guys. Good, that's who. Good. I heard him mention it at, at the end of Condition 2 and I guess the state. That's good. We got them working with us on that issue right there. Yeah, and I think we're going to need them because, you know, the housing area is something that we've never spent a whole lot of time on. We don't really know these people. We don't know the committees. We don't know the consultants to the committees who, you know, really have an issue. Um, Laurie on the phone with me earlier had said, uh, well, you know, this is Weiner's issue, you know, big time. And I didn't know if she was joking or not, because I didn't, you know, I didn't know what he cares about. Um, and so it, there's some, some learning that we have to do that they can really help us with. Okay. And, um, just one more. Like the city of Seaside, they have the water. They just need the meter. So yeah, and and that's a great point. And uh, chair, I know we talked about it briefly. If we're going to make this effort to try to reopen uh, the cease and desist order to get a you know fifty acre feet or seventy five acre feet out, we might as well make an attempt to uh, get a special exemption for meter setting for those. It doesn't fit very uh consistently with the health and safety exception to the reductions as written in the cease and desist order because the conditions there were the moratorium stays in place and all conservation uh measures remain in place but i think we you know we're going to ask for the sky and take what we can get right good good i agree with you thank you for moving on this Jeannie. Or didn't go this is yeah yeah <laughs> it is very easy for these folks though to just uh, especially in the current kind of work from home situation is to just stick by where they you know by the status quo yeah. rather than try to move anything yeah, I, I'd agree with you there. The, the lack of accessibility to our legislators is a real problem. It's hard to yeah. express yourself uh, articulately and passionately in a Zoom call. You know, <laughs> um, so uh, so you know this un, this affordable housing mandate. It uh, if, go ahead, Jean. I'm sorry. Jean, I cut you off. I'm sorry. I think she was just laughing. No, no, I didn't have anything else. <laughs> so, uh, so this affordable housing mandate, you know, the League of Cities doesn't like, okay, I'm sorry. The, the League of Cities does not like the lack of local control. I mean, this un, these mandates that come down from the Fed or the state, um, state government, especially around the uh, mandate that we have to have affordable housing everywhere, anytime, at any cost, it just flies in the face of local control. And so it's kind of the end of zoning as you know it. The, the project we heard out on um, Airport Road the other day, David, where uh, we basically said, okay, Monterey, you can go ahead and have the water allocation for the housing out there. Yep. My understanding is, and this is a little off topic, but it's still relevant. The, my understanding at the meeting was that Hans Unsler, the city manager, said that the city would indemnify us against any possible litigation. I've heard that he didn't have that authority to say, so, say that. So what does that do to our decision that night? Yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I had uh, I actually bumped into uh, Clyde Roberson out walking with Ken White okay. like two days later. And uh, Clyde was very amused. You know, he's like, indemnification? What? You know, that's never going to happen. Ha, ha, ha. What, and what good would it do anyway? You know, and so he, he definitely was poo-pooing it a little bit. Um, it looks like the developer wants to do the first project and, and take the risk 
of, of enforcement. And so go ahead and build the additional 100% uh, affordable units. On the second project, yeah. which is a series of buildings, he's gonna start by only building as much as could fit under the uh, prior use. Now, both of them are still going to trigger state scrutiny because it's a change in use from and, and due to a change yeah. in zoning. Um, so I think if the developer is loaded for bear to go ahead and go forward and and again, you know, there's no violation until the project's complete. So in the course of 2 years, trying to get it all built, permitted and built. We may know exactly what we have and we're 8 months away from a. You know, from a firm water supply coming online or something like that. So the world will be changing during the period that these are going forward. Our, our big concern was, hey, they could enforce. It's an unknown. And what are you going to do if you invest millions of dollars and they dial you back to half the water that you need? And that's where we wanted indemnification for our actions. But I'm not sure even without indemnification, if we're exposed, uh, you know, I think that might be, it could be well, an thought, closed session or something, because I do yeah. think we kind of hung our legal hat on that promise that apparently is a hollow promise. Yeah. And I, I would say Dave Loretta, who's on this call could take that in as a you know, piece of homework. I have, yeah. I thought we, the Gene? water allocation was conditioned on being indemnified. So if they can't indemnify us, yeah, but, but the water doesn't transfer. Yeah, I think that's. I'll go back to the. That was my point. To the tape on that one. I I believe that was the uh, the motion. Yeah. I, right. I'm sure it was. I'm positive. So yeah, yeah I think so. So side, there is. There is this some, is a side note. As a side note, there was an editorial. Um, I don't know a few days ago. That was sort of analyzing the number of people leaving California and what the ultimate um, increase or decrease in population was, and it was projecting a decrease in population. So we're kind of behind the curve providing housing if in the next five to 10 years, the population actually starts to decrease. I mean, that's probably a consideration. That's an interesting one too, because AMBAG has just started to revisit its next 10 year uh, growth forecast and housing arena numbers. And you're right, you, you don't need to build housing if you're not in increasing population. I mean, right. we need to build some housing because we're way behind just for the current population, which is why we've got these disparities between where you can afford to live versus where the jobs are. But, um, well, if there's an overproduction, it'll sort itself out because housing will become cheaper. Yeah. Anyway. All right. Is there any, any other discussion? Yeah. yeah uh, no, good. Uh, Dave, uh, when are you going to present this timeline to the board? And are you going to update the board on what we did earlier with the, the, with the legislation, state and federal? Yeah, well, I, I think we'll, what we'll do with the uh, update is I'll take the two bill trackers and we'll put them in as a report because for years, it, it all just kind of ended with LegCom, you know, apart from the full board seeing the legislative plan for the year, you know, usually in February, I, I think it is. Um, but then one board member expressed an interest. Well, basically it was a, it was a backhanded way of expressing interest uh, in that I send you guys the Ferguson group report every week and the uh, JEA and associates report every week. And I got an email back on, well, this is all just puff and everything. I'd much rather know what's going on with the actual legislation that we're tracking and you know how that's going and so forth. And that's why we put that into the uh, packet after our last quarterly meeting just so other members of the board can see what we're looking at or doing. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. So during the GM report, um, I'll just point to it as a, a report that's, you know, not typically in every month. Okay. And the timeline? Uh, this one? Yes. 
Last yeah, um, at some point, I don't think there's any pressing need. I mean, we went to the full board with all the options that we thought could produce water for housing. Um, and the full board said, we'll take it back to the water demand committee and work it through the water demand committee. And then we got the letter from uh, the state water board right before that uh, February committee meeting. Um, so I think we need to keep working it through both the TAC and the water demand committee until we kind of have a plan and then, then we'll take it to the full board, probably maybe the August meeting. Okay. That, Sounds that good. kind of fits this timeline. All right, that's all I have. All right. Okay, that completes item number five. Thanks, Dave. And then um, anything right now people would like to see on a future agenda? I don't have anything burning, right. so uh, no. I do think, though, under direction, we probably should hear from Dave Laredo his opinion and close or at the next water board meeting if Albany agrees on what uh, the indemnification clause in our last decision on the housing for Monterey does to the agreement, because it was on positive as part of the motion. Yeah. Good point. Fine. Yeah, and then, you know, if it was, in fact, then we can send a letter to the city of Monterey that says, uh, you know, if you're intending on proceeding with the project, uh, we're here to remind you that you need to give us indemnification before we can do any permit approvals. Sound good. But I, also, right. I also heard that the developer is, uh, his format for bringing the project forward is kind of sketchy in a way. And so for some reason, he's got some build out scenario that makes him money and then he doesn't necessarily complete his promise as far as the rest of the project goes. I'm not sure what that means exactly, but there is some sketch around this thing that I think yeah, that's, take the, a look. that's the second site. So he's got both sites, right? And uh, <coughs> the proposal on the second site is he'll do the, um, the, you know, basically the inclusionary housing. So the 20%. And so he can make money on that. But then if, if lo and behold, we did give him water to do the 100% affordable additional, he might not be obligated to do so. I mean, that's the sketchy part, I think. But if he does yeah. the first <laughs> one first, you know, he will make his money on. So I think the first ones, you know, think of it as 36 units where 20% uh, of them are affordable. And then 36 units that are 100% affordable supposedly he can still be profitable on that model. Um, and because it's a single building, he can't really build part of it and not continue. Mm -hmm. hey. Well, as, as I said, it's not really germane to the legislative committee, but it does involve a legislative action we took. So that's yeah. my stretch on getting us there. <laughs> uh, before we close up, hey, Dave, do we need... Um... Do we need support from Monterey One on stormwater and everything, all those grants she was talking about? Can we apply and? Yeah, I mean, it, it's project dependent, but yeah, if it's legislation that would benefit both of us. So take, for example, stormwater. If there's a stormwater program out there, um, we, we've talked to Pacific Grove and Monterey about shipping stormwater to Pure Water Monterey. You know, Lake Elastero is an example, and we actually did the trial. So if somebody came along with $6 million to build that connection, and we could tell City of Monterey, hey, we're going to build it for free. Um, yeah, we do that jointly. So we'll, we'll look at it in that context. We, we've kind of been doing this whole legislative stuff, keeping in mind the other agencies <laughs> regionally who uh, may not pay attention to all the same things we do. So. Okay, thank you. That's yep. all I got. All right, guys. Thank you all. Much appreciated. Thank you, Ferguson. Thank you, JEA. Appreciate thank your participation. You. We stand, thank you. We stand adjourned, guys. Have a take care. Thank, right. you. thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, have a good weekend. Yeah. Enjoy. Stay safe.